Hello, I'm Dr Octavia Cox and welcome to my channel where I do all things classic literature. Today I'm going to define and explain the meaning of antanaclasis and I'm going to do this using some examples from William Shakespeare. Antanaclasis is a key feature of puns and punning wordplay so I'm also going to define and explain what a pun is. And in order to explain the meaning of these two things, these two terms, I'm also going to have to define and explain uh, the term polysemy, which is central to both the idea of puns and the idea of antanaclasis. Now, I realise that that sounds like there's going to be a lot of definition uh, in today's video, which there is, but there's also going to be a lot of exploration of Shakespeare. So I hope you'll stay with me until the second half where I go through some examples of, from William Shakespeare in more detail. To start then with the meaning and definition of antanaclasis. Now, it's a, a long word, but it has a simple meaning. So the derivation of antanaclasis is from the Hellenistic Greek for uh, echo, for repetition, for bending and breaking against. And I think you, keeping those terms in mind is helpful for understanding what antanaclasis means. So the definition then of antanaclasis from the Oxford Dictionary of Literary Terms is a figure of speech that makes a pun or paranomasia. Paranomasia is the, it's a term that's used, that was used in ancient rhetoric to refer to any kind of play on words and the sounds, the play on the sound of words. Um, and that we, we now usually refer to this as punning. So going back to the definition then of antanaclasis, it is a figure of speech that makes a pun or paranomasia by repeating the same word or phrase, so you can also repeat the same phrase as I'm going to look at. So you, you repeat the word or the phrase, but with differing senses. So going back to the uh, derivation of antanaclasis then, it's repetition that, that breaks against or clashes with its echo. So antanaclasis plays with words and the sounds of words, so is a form of paronomasia, by repeating a word with different meanings. As I said in my introduction, in order to understand antanaclasis, we also have to understand uh, polysemy. Antanaclasis draws on and relies on polysemy. So polysemy is the linguistic term for a word's being able to, uh, or its capacity to hold two or more meanings simultaneously. So a polysemous word has two or more meanings. So for example, let's take the word sound and kind of apt word um, for today's video. And the word sound has many, many, many different meanings. So to take just two, we can think of sound as noise. So in William Shakespeare's Macbeth, for example, we have the kind of famous phrase um, said by Macbeth near the end of the play after Lady Macbeth has died, when he says, you know, that life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So that's sound as in noise. But there's also other meanings of sound, such as if something is showing good judgment, sound judgment, and um, you might say, for example, something like, that is a sound idea. Polysemy, the, a word having these dual two or more meanings, is demonstrated in antanaclasis necessarily through repetition. The fundamental part of antanaclasis is that it involves repetition. So going back to the word that I used in the example then, the word sound, we might say that one burglar might uh, say to another burglar just before they're about to break into a house, something like, any sound now would not be sound. So any noise now would not show good judgment. So it's the repetition of the word sound 
but it has those two different meanings in the same sentence. In the 18th century, Samuel Johnson, in his Dictionary of the English Language from 1755, defined antanaclasis as when the same word is repeated in a different, if not in a contrary, signification, as in thy youth learn some craft, that in thy old age thou mayest get thy living without craft. So the traditional way of understanding this uh, saying that Johnson quotes is in thy youth, in thy youth learn some craft, so learn a craft as in a skilled trade, a skilled vocation that you can have as a job, so that in old age thou mayest get thy living without craft, so that you may, um, during the rest of your life, then have this craft, this trade, so that you don't need to get your money by craft, meaning fraud or deceit. I always think, though, that if you were being slightly facetious, you could say that this saying might work slightly better the other way around. So you might say, in thy youth learn some craft, learn some deceit or fraudulent ways of uh, getting by, so that in thy old age thou mayst get thy living without having to go to work, without having to have a trade. But I leave it up to you to decide which way round you interpret um, this quotation quoted by Johnson. To look at some more examples, this is a typical example used in linguistics classes. So, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. Now, fruit flies like a banana doesn't make any sense at all. And what happens if you read that same, uh, those two kind of phrases, uh, in reverse. So what happens if you if you read it, fruit flies like a banana, which is how you might more usually read fruit flies like a banana. Time flies like an arrow. Again, time flies like an arrow is how we would understand that construction of that clause. Whereas fruit flies like a banana is how we would usually sort of phrase or emphasize uh, that construction of uh, the clause. So what's the purpose of this antanaclasis here then? This use of antanaclasis shows similarity in order to expose difference. So that you have the, the um, flies like repeated to show that actually there is often a difference in the way that we emphasize the way that we read sentences. So it exposes how even sentences of the same construction have to be read differently in order for them to make sense. And that sometimes you don't know how a sentence should be read or how it should be understood until after you have finished reading it, which is why sometimes you have to go back and read things more than once because we have many, in English at least, we have many ways of constructing a sentence which is the same, but kind of convention means that we read it and we emphasise it differently in order to uh, make sense of it, in order to understand it. Another well-known example of antanaclasis, this time with a phrase, is if you are not fired with enthusiasm, you will be fired with enthusiasm. So. Here we have, um, if you're not fired with enthusiasm, so if you're not spurred on, if you are not filled with excitement, uh, then you will be fired with enthusiasm. So your boss will sack you, you will lose your job, and the boss will do it happily. The boss will fire you with enthusiasm. This quotation is attributed to Vince Lombardi, who was a, um, an American football coach, uh, and he's quoted as having said that in the 1980s. But in fact, the dual meaning of the play on fired with enthusiasm has been uh, commonly used since the uh, early 20th century at least. So you might now be thinking to yourself, well, why aren't these puns? What's the difference between antanaclasis and a pun then? Well, to answer that, I'm first going to define what is a pun then. So the definition of pun in the Oxford Dictionary of Literary Terms is an expression that achieves emphasis or humour by contriving an 
ambiguity. So in a pun, the meanings of the two words, so you take a polysimous word, a word that has two or more meanings, and they are deliberately confused, usually for comic effects, but also for emphasis. Um, so yes, Shakespeare uses them in his comedies a lot, but he also uses them in his tragedies, as I said, for for emphasis. Back to the definition, an expression that achieves emphasis or humour by contriving an ambiguity, uh, two distinct meanings being suggested either by the same word, polysemy, um, or by two similar sounding words. Uh, so these are called homophones. So these are words that sound the same. So uh, homo meaning same and uh, phone meaning um, kind of utterance. So something like uh, you have the days of the week, but you might also say I was in a daze, I was confused. So the word days is a homophone because days, D-A-Y-S, days of the week, uh, sounds the same as days. D-A-Z-E, I was in a daze. And tanaclasis then is a type or kind of punning wordplay. But necessarily, antanaclasis includes repetition of the word or phrase that has the dual or ambiguous meaning. A pun does not need necessarily to repeat the word or phrase. So antanaclasis is a kind of pun, but a pun is not necessarily antanaclasis. As an example, I'm going to use Mary Crawford from Jane Austen's Mansfield Park, which was published in 1814. It's a beautiful example, I think, because Mary Crawford draws explicit attention to her naughty punning when she jokes about her background as part of a Navy family. So she has grown up in the house of her uncle, Admiral Crawford. And she says, Mary says, my home at my uncle's brought me acquainted with a circle of admirals, of rears and vices I saw enough. Now, do not be suspecting me of a pun, I entreat. Rears and vices are ranks of admiral in the Royal Navy. So straightforwardly, Mary Crawford is saying that her uncle's home brought her into contact with many rear admirals and uh, vice admirals. But, of course, there is also the punning, joking meaning of the words rears and vices. Vices, of course, meaning immoral or sort of reprehensible or unprincipled behaviour, often associated with um, sexual looseness, shall we say. And rears, of course, means bottoms. And by saying, do not suspect me of a pun, I entreat, of course, she's encouraging all the readers uh, and the characters in the story too, of course, but the readers to see this other meaning in the words rears and vices. Now, so Mary Crawford, we can say, is punning on the words uh, rears and vices. If you wanted to turn Mary Crawford's punning joke into antanaclasis, then you could reformulate it as something like, my home at my uncle's brought me acquainted with a circle of admirals. I saw plenty of rears and vices. So I saw plenty of rears and vices. So you have a repetition then in, in my example of exactly the same phrase, but with these two different meanings. And now I turn to some examples, some longer examples from William Shakespeare, which I'm going to unpick and analyse in a bit more detail. And as with my video last week, this is mainly an excuse for me to read and examine some more fabulous lines and images from William Shakespeare and I hope that you enjoy them too. William Shakespeare, of course, is renowned for using punning wordplay, for drawing out polysemy in his writing. And antanaclasis is one of the techniques that William Shakespeare uses throughout his works, both comically and tragically. And I'm going to start with tragedy. A famous tragic example is the soliloquy of Othello when he is about to murder his wife, Desdemona. And he says, put out the light and then put out the light. So we have a repetition of the exact same phrase with different meanings, antanaclasis. 
Othello tells himself to extinguish the candle and then kill Desdemona. So put out the light, put out the candle and then put out Desdemona. Throughout the play, Desdemona has been associated with light and goodness and those two have also been correlated. Light and goodness have been um, correlated. So put out the light also implies that he, that Othello will put out the good, put out the goodness. So what is the effect of the Antanaclasis here? Well, Othello is trying to, or it seems to me that Othello is trying to convince himself that killing Desdemona will be as easy as snuffing out a candle. So put out the light and then put out the light, saying, you know, just put out the candle and then just put out Desdemona. You know, that, the, that those two things are as easy as each other. That snuffing out Desdemona will be as easy as snuffing out a candle. But at the same time, the use of light kind of acknowledges that to do so will extinguish goodness. So put out the light and then put out the light. You could also read as meaning put out the light of the candle and then put out the light of goodness. And now an example from one of Shakespeare's comedies. So in Twelfth Night, Feste, the clown figure, comically plays with Viola by drawing on two meanings of the word live. So on the one hand, you have earn your living. So a writer might say that they live by their pen. And then also you have uh, live as in um, where you live, the place that you dwell, your home. The scene opens with Viola saying, save thee, friend, and thy music. Dost thou live by thy tabor? That means drum. So dost thou live by thy drum? So are you a musician? Do you live by, do you earn your living by playing music? No, sir, I live by the church. Um, so Festa here is saying sir because Viola at this time is dressed as a man, she's dressed as Cesario. Um, so Feste calls her sir. No sir, I live by the church. Viola says, art thou a churchman? So do you earn your money from the church? Uh, do you earn your money being a priest? No such matter sir, I do live by the church for I do live at my house and my house doth stand by the church. So what's the effect of the Antanaclasis here? What does it reveal to us? Well, it shows, I think, that Feste is a tricky customer whose words are slightly slippery and who clearly enjoys uh, playing with and teasing and confusing people. And this will come to be uh, important uh, later in the play as Malvolio will learn to his cost. And now an example where the tone I think is a bit less clear than in my first two examples. So in Henry V, um, after England has defeated the French at the Battle of Agincourt, the comic uh, and rather unscrupulous character of Pistol beats a rather ignominious uh, retreat. Uh, this is post all the fighting. Um, and this uh, uh, quotation comes from his last speech in the play. So Pistol says, to England will I steal, and there I'll steal. So the two meanings of steal here are, to England I will steal, I will sneak off, I will um, hidden, run away in a sort of hidden manner, uh, and there I'll steal, there I'll thieve, there I'll rob. And what is the effect of the Antanaclasis here? Well, both meanings of the word steal suggest skullduggery and living under the radar. And the repetition, steal, steal, I think emphasises that he now plans to live outside of the law. And this is a comic uh, moment, but I think a serious point is also being made in a kind of broader sense. So earlier in the speech, Pistol had said, and from my weary limbs, honour is cudgelled. Well, bored I'll turn. So what Pistol is sort of doing in this speech is emphasising the difference between those who return to England, not 
cudgelled of their honour, so who returned to England with honour and pomp and ceremony. So we might think of King Henry V himself here, who returns to England uh, in pomp and ceremony and victory and so on. And Henry V is often a play that is seen as being a kind of pro, pro war, pro England, pro sort of military, etc. And lots of our phrases come from Henry V, you know, once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more. Lots of our sort of military uh, phrases come from Henry V. Um, and it can be read in that, in that sense. And so for just as a quick aside, another example. So uh, Laurence Olivier's production, his film of Henry V, for example, uh, was produced during World War II and lots of the bits that uh, are perhaps less complementary of Henry V. Um, so, for example, the, the, the scene with the traitors and the way that Henry V treats the traitors, those are all kind of removed. And that film was made during the Second World War and was a, a, a kind of propagandistic interpretation of the play. So, but in this final speech of Pistols, he's comparing his fate to those who returned to England with honour. And he returns without honour. You know, he, to England, he has to steal. And there, when he's in England, he has to steal. You know, yes, we've had this great victory at the Battle of Agincourt, but it hasn't, <laughs> it hasn't made life brilliant overnight for everybody. There are still people that have to steal. Not everybody has been so well served by this war as Henry V himself has been. Another Shakespearean example of Antanaclasis comes in the opening lines of Romeo and Juliet. So this is in the prologue um, spoken by the chorus. The chorus declares, two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. So the Oxford English Dictionary defines civil in these two kind of crucial ways here. So the first meaning uh, in terms of the civil blood, we might think of as being similar to our phrase civil war. So if you have a civil war, it's between people <laughs> within the same community. Uh, so civil here is relating to uh, community, to citizenship, and it's related to the word civilian. Then we have another second meaning of the word civil, so civil hands unclean. And this use of the word civil relates to education, to culture, to being um, cultivated, to being well bred. Um, and in, in civil in this sense, uh, meaning civilised. So what is the effect of the antanaclasis here, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean? Well, the chorus draws on two meanings of civil to highlight from the play's very opening the tension uh, within the play between blood ties, so civil as in community, so, and we have the different groups, we have the Montagues and the Capulets, and behaviour, so what is civilised, that will play out during the course of the rest of the play, what civil war will make apparently civilised people do. And in my final example, I want to show more than two meanings in the text's repetition. So this is a much longer example, but I think it's really fascinating. So Hamlet is perhaps the character or the, the character within Shakespeare's plays with the most linguistic skill and dexterity, or at least the most self-consciously um, playful with the way that he uses language and how kind of overtly he presents his ability to use language to the audience. So in the opening of uh, Act 5 of Hamlet, this is a famous scene, this is when Hamlet watches the grave diggers digging a grave for Ophelia. And he speculates about the possible former living people who are now skeletons in the dirt. 
And this is the scene um, in which Hamlet will go on to see the skull of the old king's jester. Um, the famous line, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him. This is quite a long quotation, but I think it's worth um, going through in detail. So first I'm going to just read through it and then I'm going to go through it in a bit more detail. So this is the quotation. There's another. Why? Might not that be the skull of a lawyer? Where be his quiddities now? His quillets, his cases, his tenures and his tricks. Why does he suffer this rude knave now to knock him about the sconce with a dirty shovel? And will not tell him of his action of battery? Hum, this fellow might be in his time a great buyer of land with his statutes, his recognizances, his fines, his double vouchers, his recoveries. Is this the fine of his fines and the recovery of his recoveries? To have his fine pate full of fine dirt? So Hamlet, in this final sentence, uses different, uh, two different cases of polysemy. So he uses fine in four different ways and recovery in two. So let me go through the passage then in a bit more detail. There's another, so there's another skull. Why may not that be the skull of a lawyer? Where be his quiddities now? So quiddities, the Oxford English Dictionary defines quiddity as the inherent nature or essence of a person or thing. What makes a thing what it is. So Hamlet is looking at this skull and saying, where is that person's essence now? Where be his quiddities now? His quillets. So that, that means his kind of quibbling arguments, his loyally uh, his loyally quillets, his loyally arguing, his cases, his tenures. So tenures are um, sort of legal documents to do with property. And his tricks. Where are his tricks? Why does he suffer this rude knave now to knock him about the sconce, so the head, to knock him about the head with a dirty shovel and will not tell him of his action of battery? So his... Um, an action of battery, his litigation um, concerning physical assault. So, you know, that that he's not suing him. So Hamlet's kind of joke here is that, you know, when he was alive, the lawyer, if he'd been hit about the head like that, would, would sue somebody for physical assault. Why does he suffer this rude knave now to knock him about the sconce with a dirty shovel and will not tell him of his action of battery? Hum. This fellow might be in his time a great buyer of land with his statutes. So those are um, legal documents uh, concerning debt secured on land. They're something akin to what we might call today a mortgage. His recognizances. Um, again, those are legal documents um, that formally acknowledge a debt his fines. So here we have the first meaning of the word fine. And this is a, this meaning of fine is a kind of legal sleight of hand. It's quite a technical definition. It's to do with land ownership. And the Oxford English Dictionary defines this uh, version or this meaning of fine as a compromise made between parties in a fictitious or collusive lawsuit. So that means that both sides are actually acting together. So they have to kind of go to the law to settle whatever needs to be settled, but they're not, uh, they're not sort of against each other. They're actually working in collusion in order for them both to achieve whatever it is that they want to achieve. Um, so a compromise made between two parties for the possession of land formally in use as a means of conveyance in cases where the ordinary means were unavailable or less effective. So there's very precise here use of the word fine in its kind of legal term. And Hamlet generally here is using a lot of technical terms. He's kind of showing off his knowledge. And Hamlet continues to show off his legal knowledge, um, his double vouchers. So that is to do with the practice of having two witnesses vouch for a claimant's ownership of land. His recoveries, um, and this is another word that we'll get on to see that is antanaclasis, and this is one definition, one meaning of 
recoveries. The Oxford English Dictionary, again, it's a legal term, defines recoveries here as the fact or process of gaining or regaining possession of or a right to property, compensation, etc. by a legal process or judgment. So his recoveries of land, essentially. And then we get to the question that Hamlet's linguistic precision and rhetorical dexterity has been building to. Is this the fine of his fines and the recovery of his recoveries, to have his fine pate full of fine dirt? And you can see that here we have four uses of fine and two uses of recovery. So is this the fine? This is the second meaning of fine and it means the conclusion or the end or the net result of. So is this the the purpose of his fines? And this use of fine goes back to the one that I was talking about earlier, the, the kind of very technical legal meaning of fine. So the kind of ingenious trickery um, that he used in his legal cases. Is that the purpose of all that ingenious trickery that this lawyer and this landowner went through in their life? And the recovery, so this is the, the money that he got back uh, kind of during all these legal disputes, the, the money that he has recuperated. So the recovery of his recoveries, so his legal land transactions to have his fine pate. And fine here in its third meaning means brilliant, superior, excellent, um, you know, his fine pate, his excellent head. So pate means head. So his kind of brilliant mind. To have his brilliant mind full of fine dirt. Fine here meaning um, very well powdered. Um, so fine uh, well powdered dirt earth is this the fine of his fines to have his fine pate full of fine dirt is this the end is this the purpose of all that legal activity to have his brilliant mind full of powdered dirt and there's a really kind of grim irony here you know what are hamlet's quiddities his inherent nature or essence which makes Hamlet Hamlet. Well, perhaps it is his fine pate, his dissembling intellect that plays these kinds of linguistic games with itself constantly, almost to the point of kind of immobilizing him or stopping him from acting, from moving on. But like the lawyer and landowner, what is the fine? the end purpose of Hamlet's fine pate, his beautiful mind, when his head, like theirs, will one day be full of fine dirt. So what is the effect of the antanaclasis here? Well, I think the effect of the repeated use of fine and indeed recovery, but especially fine, is almost to show Hamlet's mind getting stuck on this thought you know, that he's kind of going down the, the mental rabbit hole. It shows his kind of intellectual and linguistic, dexter linguistic dexterity, on the one hand, that he can utilise four meanings of one word in a sentence and, you know, can do that, can use antanaclasis twice in one short sentence, or clause of a sentence. But simultaneously, that he can't or often that he can't get beyond beyond the, the thinking about it, that he's going over and over the same thought again and again in his mind. That's his sort of mental pattern. And so it's this use of antenna classes, I think here kind of embodies what is brilliant and what is a, what inhibits Hamlet's mind kind of encapsulates it beautifully in one short uh, sentence, part of a sentence. I think the other thing about the use of antenna classes here is that it really 
sticks in the reader's or the audience's mind because it boils down a really quite complicated existential thought into a kind of aphorism that, because it repeats the same word four times, might be more easy to remember because it sort of, it just hones it with kind of beautiful precision, really, that that thought, you know, what is the fine of this fine, <laughs> to have one's fine head full of fine dirt? What is the point of life if you're just going to end up a skull in the ground? You can kind of think over, or the reader or the audience member can kind of think over that phrase <laughs> in their own life, you know, what is the fine of my fines? That my fine head will be full of fine dirt one day. What's the point of life given that one day I will just be a skull in the ground? I think this use of antanaclasis really kind of crystallises the conundrum or the problem that, that Hamlet is grappling with and sort of exposes it, exposes a kind of fundamental flaw really in Hamlet even at this very moment, which is so what? So what? I can stand here and I can use four different meanings of the word fine in one sentence. Well, aren't I clever? But so what? Why does it matter? That same brain which is producing all that thinking is one day just going to be in the dirt. It's just going to be nothing in the dirt. And all my essence, quiddities, where is that going to go? And Yes, I think it's just beautifully, that thought is kind of beautifully encapsulated, art articulated, and at the same time, it kind of exposes the pointlessness of all Hamlet's great thinking. Is this the fine of his fines, to have his fine pate full of fine dirt? You know, it's boiling that huge existential thought down into kind of neat aphoristic phrase. It's just beautiful. Thank you very much indeed for watching. I do hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, then do press the thumbs up button. It does help me out in YouTube's algorithm. And if you like what I do here on my channel where I analyse classic literature uh, and define <laughs> literary terms sometimes too, then do uh, subscribe to the channel. And I'd love to know your thoughts on antanaclasis. Do you have any of your own fabulous examples? Let me know in the comments below.